Alrighty, so you guys had to do some review here. But, but uh, 2.4 was most of your variance, and I said you can do these in your calculator. You don't have to make the chart like we did in class. Um, as long as you understand that the one difference in this, the mean, is always the mean for the sample or the population. Because how do we find an average of something? And divide by the number? And it will divide by the number that there were. So whether it is the sum divided by n for a population or the sum divided by n for a sample, it's going to come out to be the same thing, right? So the mean is the same for the population and the sample. The standard deviation, however, this is the standard deviation for population. Think of the O. S, X is the standard deviation for sample. Look at the S. The reason being, underneath the square root, you divide this by N. Underneath the square root, you divide by N minus 1. So that's the difference. That's why those two things are different. The mean stays the same. So whether you use the U or the X bar, they're both the same. I didn't need you to do this any longer, but realize that's why they're different. If you need to find the variance from your calculator, remember going to stat number five, uh, sorry, um, number five stat, bears number five stat, and then go to either your population or your sample and square it. This will give you your variance. It's the opposite of when we use the table. Table, we find the variance first, then we take the square root. The calculator only gives you standard deviation. So you just have to square it. But what happens is if you round it and then square it, you don't get back to the true variance. Because you round it. I mean, rank it, yes, you're going to round your variance anyway. And that has some effect. So it's just a standard deviation. Oh, square. Square. That's all the variance is. Because when we did the chart, the table, that we, we added up all those columns, we divided, that was our variance. Then we took the square root, that was our standard deviation. So we have to do the opposite here. Okay, so can everybody put this in your L1? Find me the range, find me the mean, the, the variance and the standard deviation for the population? Yes. Yeah. Um, technically, your mean is one decimal place more than your data is. Your standard deviation and your variance usually follow that. If you're just going to find a variance or a standard deviation by itself, then go three decimal places. If it's in relation to nothing else, then it's great. The black one. The black one. Yeah, have a placeholder. Okay, any questions? Everybody good with this? You realize when you use your calculator, like the yellow ones, when they give you the where your, where your data is in L1, then it says frequency. Sometimes you have to clear that out. Sometimes, for some odd reason, it says L1, L1. So you'll have to clear that out if you're no frequency. And you know you can use any of the tables. You can use L2. If you put it in L2, use L2. Knock it off. Okay, 27. Same thing. You had a sample. This one told you it was a sample. And you had to find the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. The sample mean and the population mean are found the same way. This time you're looking up SX and you're squaring it to get your variance. Because this was dollars, <coughs> I went two decimal places. Just because it doesn't make sense to go one decimal place on your dollars, right? If you're going to go one decimal place more than your mean, if you're me, if you're more than your data, if your data is in dollars, one decimal place kind of doesn't cut it for money. So you have to use your, your common sense about that and go two decimal places on money. Anybody have a question? No? If you need to put your data in order, you know how to put it in your L1 and do a sort A. Okay? This course is also nice because you're going to use a different part of your calculator this time around. We do a lot of statistical things in your calculator. A lot of the tests we do, when we do all these tests, 
in the next units or so, we use your calculator for. So it gives you another way to make use of all that money that you spend on those calculators. Okay, the mean rate, this is the mean for a sample. So this is your X bar. Always pull out your information. This is your SX. They don't need to tell you again sample because they said for a sample, so that's your sample standard deviation. Between what two values do 99% of your data lie? They can tell you that this was a bell shape or a normal curve because it could be the test theorem, the less it could be skewed. If it's skewed, I mean that could be the Chevy test theorem. So they tell you it's a normal curve. Now, do you have to know that they're the plus or minus one, the plus or minus two? You should. You should know plus or minus one, plus or minus two. Um, I'll give you a graph if it helps on your test tomorrow for your normal curve. Uh, I'll give you the one from the regions. It's, it's incremented by halves. Or I can give you the one out of the book, which is incremented by whole numbers. But just, you should know your basic ones. Plus or minus one standard deviation <laughs> is about 68%. Plus or minus two standard deviations is about 95%. And plus or minus three is your 99.7. It's far more exact if you use the one from the algebra two exam because you add up each individual one. They just do a, an approximation because we never really even use the table the chart anymore. We, we use your z-square table. But when we looked up table four of the z-squares, that's where all our areas come from. And they'll be far more exact than this. And that's what we'll be heading towards. Okay? This is this is one part that some of you guys had problems with, with the Chevy Chef theorem part. Chevy Chef says, I'm gonna find out how many standard deviations I am above and below the mean, but I can't use those percents because this is not a normal curve. I still need to know how many standard deviations I am away from the mean. So we still sketch a normal curve. And we figure out between 20 and 52 that we're plus or minus two standard deviations above and below the mean. So our k, our standard deviations, is two. Now, we can't use those percents. We can't use 95% because they're telling us this is not a normal curve. It's skewed somehow. So ChemCheck has a little formula and you can only do a two or a three, so it gives you an approximation of how much percent of your data will be there. So if you use the two, it's 75%. If you use the three, it comes out to 88.9%. And then it said, how many customers? Would you leave your answer at 75% if it said how many? No. Yeah. Oh. Well, no, because if they said what percent is between, then you give me 75. If they said how many customers, you look for how many you started with. How many did I start with? And the last thing you do is multiply and find out what percent, 75% of 40, is the customers that met that. And that would be 30. But this is the one that a lot of you missed on the, the quiz that we did. It can't be a one because if you do one divided by one, you get one. And one minus one is zero. You can't approximate that close because you don't know where your skew is. You don't know how dramatic that curve is. It could be very slight. It could be very, very dramatic. So, as a an overall estimate, it comes up with 75 and about 89. From a random sample, again sample, find the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. You had a frequency this time. They, they were counting how many TV, how many homes have one, zero TVs, one TV, two, three, four, five TVs. So there's your frequency. This is your L1, L2. Now, you have to say in your calculator, one bear stat, the reason we use one bear and not two bear because you only have one variable, it's the number of TVs. The household is a frequency. So L1 comma L2. 
get your sample mean and your sample standard deviation. Okay, that's all that I asked you to do for that. We didn't have to make another table for this. It was kind of senseless to go through a whole table for this. Because at the end, you just have to multiply two columns. So we didn't have to do that. Can everybody do the L1, L2? Okay, put this in your L1 table. Go to stat edit. Put this in your L2. And P.S. you can't sort these once you have them in. Because it won't sort them together. Now you have L1, L2. Now go to stat, count. Get one for one there, stat. Your data goes in L1, and your frequency goes in L2. And it'll automatically do this for you. What it does is this, it multiplies these things. Because you're saying, I have 13 twos. I have eight ones. I can string these out. I have one zero. I have eight ones. I have 13 twos. I can add all these up without a frequency table. But this is, this is how multiplication works, 1 times 8. See it? 2 times 13. And this is one of these. So if we multiply these, we're multiplying, getting that sum, and then we're calculating your total frequency and dividing it. But your calculator takes care of it. So are you okay with that? See it? Important that you know how to work the calculator. Um, here was a, a box and whisker, giving your minimum, your five summary numbers, you find your five summary numbers way at the bottom of that L1 list. If you do your one year stat, way at the bottom. It's just an L1, remember your intercourse now range? Mm -hmm. Okay. How many motorcycles? How many motorcycles fall on or below? They asked you on or below. Now, here's the difference. If you went with on or below 54, because this is a 54, you could go to this 54 and do this on or below, because each 54 is the same ranking. But considering how many years in your quartile, you're gonna go with this 54. So if you use this 54, you're going to get, counting this, you're going to get 17. If you use this 54 where it fell in between, then you're going to get 16. But technically, these 54s are the same. So you should go with this 54. And they wanted you to count that for some reason. They wanted you to count that. We can also throw in here to see if we have any outliers. Remember how to figure out outliers? Uh-huh, times 1.5. You have your interquartile range, good, times 1.5. So let's take 6.5 times 1.5. 9.5. 9.5? Thank you. Now, we're going to take, because this is your box and whisker, we want to know when it falls, how far to the left of this guy how far to the right of this guy? We want to know where those outliers are. So we're going to take your quartile one. And what are we going to do to that 9.75? Minus it, because we want it to come below here, right? So your quartile one is 47.5 minus 9.5. If there's anything below 38, it's an outlier. Look what your minimum is. What's your minimum? 42. So is there anything below 38? No. no. So we're good on that side. Then on this side, we want to know if it's above that amount. So if it's above, what do we have to do? Add it. Good. Very good. So we take your Q3 and we add 9.75. I've added 9.5 by asking on that. So do we have anything above 63.75? No, your max was 60. So your min and your max also help you looking where your um, outliers are. If our max was, say, 80, we would have to look at our data to see which ones actually were above 63.75. Anything 64 and above would be above it. Are you guys okay with this? 
90 percentiles. Okay, here's your T-scores. Again, we have a normal curve. I want the sketches. I want to see your sketches out there. Make sure you give me positives and negatives. Okay. Um, I want I want you to see because what's important is if you come up with a z-score that's positive and it should have been negative, you should be able to tell that exactly where your x fell. So if this is my 16,500. It's falling to the right of the sky. Doesn't my answer have to be positive? So I know this attracts the larger minus the smaller. Even if you forget the formula, if you forget that you say x minus the mean over the standard deviation, it will come to you when you know if it's positive or negative. You're always divided by standard deviation, so that works out. And two decimals, round to two. Anything above or below the plus or minus two is unusual. Anything above or below the plus or minus three is very unusual. There's a little, little teeny decimal of a percent outside the three. So that would be really unusual to get. So in other words, if you had a pickup truck and your pickup truck weighed 5,500 pounds, you're over here somewhere. You're kind of like riding towards the end of that. It's pretty unusual that you have such a light pickup truck compared to the, the average weight of your pickup truck. Same thing with this. It would be pretty unusual if you had something sitting out there. Like 19,000 pounds. It's an extra pickup truck. Can you all find your Z squares? That has to be the easiest thing of this. It, it is easy, but I really, really need you to get the curve. And we'll want to work again with this, we'll be using the areas, using your tables. So this is a good introduction. Wait, yeah. Yeah. Can we still just the number of the mean and the standard deviation? Yeah, it still is your standard deviation to above and below the mean. But what happens is you, you can only find, if you looked at your chart, one above, two above, 1.5. Now you can find all of them. So if it's like the number they give me minus the mean and stuff, why would it go through them? Well, because I want you to see the placement to see oh, where they're falling between. The yes, yes. Because that's really, really important to us. Any other questions for the test tomorrow?